we're going to give we're going to give a few minutes for other people to join. I could see that we have about 15 participants. Some people are experiencing um, a little network challenge. So while we wait for others to join, I uh, would really love to know where you're joining from. So on the chat box, please let's have your name and then your location. We know that some people are joining from the uh, different uh, zones. We'd love to know where you're joining from and also we'd love to know your profession. So please share that with us on the, on the chat box while we wait for other people to join. Thank you so much and we're glad to have you in today's section. It's in commemoration. Today's section is uh, in commemoration of the upcoming World Hepatitis Day. So yearly, we celebrate um, the World Hepatitis Day. And um, today our topic is going to be focused around um, early detection, treatment, prevention. And today's theme is, uh, the theme of the World Hepatitis Day this year is, it's time for action. We have our presenters, our guests, uh, special subject matter experts here. I would love to confirm if they are on the call. Dr. Mark, are you on the call? And also Dr. Philip. Yes, Dr. Okay. Manko is one. Oh, that's great. That's great. We're happy, we're happy to have you here today. Uh, Dr. Why Dr. Philip joins, um, I would like to once again, I appreciate everyone who had made out uh, time to be here today. Um, Dr. Philip is going to be our first uh, presenter for today, and he'll be taking us on hepatitis, uh, early detection, prevention, and diagnosis of uh, hepatitis. Dr. Philip, please confirm with us if you're on the call. Dr. Philip. Okay, I guess he's not here yet. So that means that um, Dr. Manko might have to go ahead. I don't know if we have to wait for Dr. Philip to join. So I'll try to, I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can have the presenter slide. Dr. Philip, are you on the call now? Okay, not yet. Okay, so Alina, please go ahead and share Dr. Marco's slide. He's going to be our first presenter for today. Thank you. Thank you. 
Please, I would like to plead on every one of us to mute our mic, please. Thank you so much, Alina. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Marco, it's joining us um, now. So, Dr. Marco, please go ahead. Uh, your slide is being projected. Thank you so much. So who, who is presenting? Uh, Dr. Marco is presenting. Please, Dr. Marco. Please. Dr. Marco, please, are you still on the call? OK, your slide is up now. Thank you. I think he has dropped off the call. I don't see him in the participants. Okay, I guess it's network. Um, so um, I think we might have to go ahead with the second uh, presenter. Dr. Philip is currently on the call right now. So um, I would like to introduce the second speaker, Dr. Philip Oshun. He has a vast experience responding to outbreak of diseases of public health importance in the country. He's a master trainer in infection prevention and control in Nigeria and have trained a number of IPC practitioners. He is the infection prevention and control focal person for the Orange Network at Lut and also a member of the Infection Prevention and Com Control Committee and Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee. So please let's make welcome uh, Dr. Philip. Mm. Dr. Philip, we're happy to have you here today. Mm. Please go ahead with your presentation. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Philip Oshun, and I work at the University of Lagos and Lagos University Teaching Hospital. Next slide, please. So if we, we are discussing preventing hepatitis B um, in healthcare settings. So our discussion is will be limited to um, the healthcare facilities, including the patients that come to the facilities and the healthcare workers that take care of these patients. So, um, the beauty about hepatitis B is that it's a preventable uh, disease. Vaccines are available that are safe and effective. In 2022, the uh, World Health Organization estimated that there were 254 million people living with chronic hepatitis B with 1.2 million infections yearly. Uh, this has dropped from about 294 that was reported in 2019. And it's estimated to cost about 1.1 million deaths. Uh, so also hepatitis C, about 58 million people uh, with 1.5 million new infections yearly. Next slide. So how should, um, how is the infection transmitted, especially in the healthcare settings? So in healthcare settings, the infections are transmitted mainly by uh, blood transfusion, needle stick injuries, uh, splashes of body fluids, contaminated medical equipment, unsafe injection practices, uh, in different invasive procedures, including surgery and dental procedures, and outside of the hospital or healthcare setting, can be transmitted from mother to child and, and sexual intercourse. Next. So 
how should we uh, prevent infections, hepatitis B infections or hepatitis C or and hepatitis C and B in the um, healthcare setting? is to do standard precautions. And what are standard precautions? And it, these are precautions that used to be called universal precautions in the early days of HIV. Uh, they, they're now called standard precautions and they're really the minimum standard of infection prevention and control practices that should be practiced by all healthcare workers. So all healthcare workers in all healthcare settings, whether it's in um, hospital, whether it's the clinic, whether the patient is on the ward, or even uh, healthcare in an ambulance, wherever healthcare is uh, provided for the patient at all times. So it's not only in the morning, afternoon, or night, at all times. So anytime we care for a patient, and we've mentioned that anywhere we care for the patient, that's in all healthcare settings. And lastly, for all patients, so we need to consider or assume that the blood and body fluid of any patient is potentially infectious. That is the principle of standard precaution. So minimum standard for all healthcare workers, uh, for all uh, healthcare settings, for all patients. So we're not going to be looking at the face of the patient to look at and say this person is healthy or the other person is unhealthy. So, and at all times. So assume that the blood and blood body fluid of any patient that you come in contact with uh, is potentially infectious so that you can take this minimum standard of uh, infection prevention and control practices. Next slide. So what are the components of standard precaution? And hygiene, injection safety, um, sharps disposal, disposal, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization and use of uh, personal protective equipment. Next slide. So we'll go through all these one by one. So we start with the most common and the most important and hygiene. That's the single most effective measure to reduce healthcare associated infection. So infection like um, hepatitis B in the healthcare setting, we need to consider and hygiene. And what is and hygiene? Next slide. Um, it includes use of alcohol-based hand rub and washing hands with soap and water, hand washing with soap and water and use of alcohol-based androp. So there are five rules that we must uh, obey for and hygiene. The first is that it should be performed at the point of care, at the point of care. So and hygiene should be done at the point of care where the patient receives care at that bedside, on the bed when sitting down. Uh, Can you go back to the, the slide before, please? Uh, the second rule, please go back to the slide before. The second rule is that we should prefer to use alcohol-based hand rub because that's the one that is easy to use at the patient's bedside. That's at the point of care. And it's also faster, more effective, and better tolerated. But when hands, when the hands are visibly soiled or dirty, then hand washing with soap and water should be done. Uh, indication for hand hygiene is based on the five moments. We'll look at all those five moments. And the last one is that we should use the appropriate technique and time duration. And we'll discuss that further. Next slide. So what are the five moments of hand hygiene? Next slide, please. So the World Health Organization has uh, put this together for all of us to consider and hygiene in the same way. Um, so these five moments are for us to know when should we do and hygiene. 
The first one is before touching a patient. So we should clean our hands, do hand hygiene before touching the patient. So as you're approaching the patient, do hand hygiene so that before you touch the patient, um, your hands should have been clean. And this will protect the patient against harmful germs car carried on the healthcare worker's hand because we know that the hands are the most common vehicle for transmission of infections in the healthcare setting. Moment two is before clean or aseptic procedure. So before accessing a critical site, mucous membrane, sterile sites, uh, we should uh, do hand hygiene. So for example, wound dressing, uh, setting up an IV cannula, uh, endotracheal intubation, uh, uh, suctioning in the, of the in the on the ward. All these procedures we should do and hygiene before uh, doing the procedures. And most of these procedures we wear gloves, so that means before wearing the gloves to do these procedures, we should do and hygiene. And this is to protect the patient uh, uh, against harmful germs carried on the patient's own body and also on the uh, healthcare worker's hands. Next slide. Sorry, next. So the moment three, after body fluid exposure risk, and this uh, usually occurs when uh, a procedure has been done or uh, when a hand touches, uh, for example, someone who is disposing um, a urinal containing urine or a urinal containing uh, feces or a sputum uh, cup or any procedures like I've mentioned earlier. Once that procedure is completed, uh, the, that person must have been exposed to body fluid. So once there's a body fluid exposure risk, then do hand hygiene. And usually after body fluid exposure risk, you would remove gloves. So immediately after removing the gloves, do the hand hygiene. This is to protect yourself and the healthcare environment from harmful germs from the patient. So this after procedure is to protect the healthcare worker and the healthcare environment. Next, moment four, that's after touching a patient. So moment one and four are complementary. Moment one is before touching a patient. Moment four is after touching a patient. So once uh, you finished examining a patient, that's when, when you touch, whether you've done a uh, pulse rate, you've checked the pulse rate or you've done, um, counted the respiratory rate or taking the uh, blood pressure or um, the oxygen saturation using a pulse oximeter yeah. or the physiotherapist who comes to um, do phys physio on the patients. Then once this is, once you've completed uh, any examination on the patient before after leaving, after touching the patient, before leaving the patient's environment, then you should do hand hygiene. And the last one is after touching patient surroundings. Uh, some people will come into the patient's point of care or the patient's zone without touching the patient at all. So cleaner who comes to clean the bedside cabinet, clean the bed or the bed drills without touching the patient, or medical students who join ward rounds or resident doctors that don't touch patient but hang on the drip stand, they rest on the bed rails or on the bed bedside table. Uh, these are all in the patient zone. So once you've touched any objects or furniture in the patient zone and you have not touched the patient, then this is the moment that concerns you. That is moment five. After touching patient surrounding, do under hygiene. And this is to protect yourself and the healthcare environment against harmful germs. Next slide. So we have looked at the five moments. The first is before touching a patient. Second moment is before clean or aseptic procedure. Moment three is after body fluid exposure risk. Moment four is after touching a patient. Moment five is after touching the patient surrounding. So these are all the moments for which, or the opportunities for us to practice 
hand hygiene in the healthcare setting. Next slide. So the next will be the technique, the appropriate technique and timing. Hand use of alcohol hand rub should be 20 to 30 seconds, hand washing 40 to 60 seconds. With hand washing, rinse hands thoroughly and use a single use towel, um, disposable paper towel or um, reusable uh, towel that you use once, a single use towel. And make sure you use that towel to turn off the tap. You shouldn't use your hands to turn off the tap so that the hands does not get the clean. The hands that you have uh, washed does not get contaminated. So we um, frown against sharing towels. So there should not be a, sing a common use towel. Um, it should be single use, use and discard. You can discard for um, decontamination or reprocessing or use paper towels. So sharing towels or multiple multiple healthcare workers using the same towel is discouraged because that means at the end, you have washed your hands and contaminated it all, all over again. And that means the purpose of hand hygiene has been defeated. So timing and um, technique, very, very important. Next slide. The next um, component of standard precaution that we'll discuss is the use of personal protective equipment. So these act as barriers uh, to prevent um, contacts with blood or body fluid. And to do this, you need to prefer, uh, do a risk assessment uh, to determine what are the risks involved uh, in the care that you would like to give to the patients. So gloves, to protect the hand, uh, the gloves can be um, sterile gloves or the disposable glove. Then mask to protect the mouth and nose against flashes and blood, um, against flashes of blood and body fluids. And this is uh, one of the ways um, hepatitis B can be transmitted in the healthcare setting. Next slide. Um, use of gown or apron to protect intact skin or clothing, goggles to protect the eyes uh, from splashes, or face shield uh, to protect the mouth, nose, eyes, and face. Uh, so these are um, equipment, PPEs act as barriers against uh, the splashes uh, or exposure to blood and body fluids, which may be potentially infectious. Next slide. Then safe injection practices. Um, we've had healthcare workers get infected in the healthcare setting through needle stick injuries or sh injuries from shafts. So it's important that we practice uh, safe injection practices. Once needle, one syringe, only one time. So do not reuse needles, do not reuse syringes. And these are just safety tips. You should not reuse syringes or needles. Never replace the cap on the used needles because it's prone to needle stick injury. And give injections only when they are necessary. If the patient can take a tablet, then give a tablet and reduce the number of injections. Uh, never leave needle in the septum of a vial. So once you once you withdraw um, antibiotics, for example, from a drug vial, then remove the needle and uh, discard or appropriately. Do not bend, break, or manipulate uh, needles uh, using your hands. Next slide. Prepare injections in a clean workspace um, so that there's no risk of contamination because uh, you don't want to contaminate um, injections when you're mixing um, powder, uh, especially when mixing the um, injection, pow sorry, powder for injection. Do not use 
um, bags of intravenous fluid as a common source supply. And we notice this uh, a lot in, um, especially in neonatal wards, where a single um, normal saline uh, bag is put in the center of the ward and everybody comes, if you want to mix drug or flush the line, everybody comes to that common source and we draw um, fluid to flush a line or to mix anti uh, drugs or antibiotics for patients. Uh, this is highly discouraged. So don't use uh, a bags of fluid as a common source supply for multiple patients. And also as much as possible, avoid use of multi-dose vials. If, that's, if you have to do that, then dedicate it for a single patient use. Next slide. And when we're drawing um, in, uh, antibiotics, um, ensure that you do that with a sterile needle and syringe. Injection safety. So um, there are many different types of uh, needles and syringes that help to protect the healthcare worker um, during uh, venipuncture or setting up a line uh, uh, in the hospital. So it's, it's important for us to ensure that we use these um, syringes and needles that prevent uh, Sharps injury. Next slide. The next is disposal, waste disposal, especially Sharps disposal. So Sharps should not be disposed into the normal uh, waste bin. They should be disposed in the Sharps container um so once need and this sharp container should be placed at the point of care so they should be very close to where needles are used so if you're going to do a procedure or give an injection set up a line that anything that involves sharps there should be a sharp box close to where the where um care is being given to the patient so at the point of care, so that it can be disposed immediately. And it is the responsibility of the person who has uh, used the sharps to dispose the sharp. You shouldn't wait for somebody else to dispose needles and syringes for you. Once you've used needles and syringes and other sharp objects, just dispose them immediately. Please take it as your responsibility to dispose sharps into the sharps container immediately after the procedure and once it is three quarters full you should seal close and seal the container uh, for uh, disposal into the incinerator next slide Next slide. So sharps, this, sharps uh, boxes should be placed uh, at the point of care. Next is um, medical equipment. So that's one way uh, that um, we've heard, uh, we've read many uh, reports, not only in the country, outside the country, of um, spread of infection of hepatitis, of viral hepatitis uh, in dental care uh, because of of poorly processed uh, medical equipment during surgery uh, from contaminated equipment. Uh, so it is very important that we do infection and sterilization of reusable medical equipment. So handle equipment solved with blood or body fluids to prevent uh, skin and mem membrane exposure and contamination of clothing. So clean cleaning, and disinfection of reusable equipment. And those that are single use should be discarded immediately. So for reprocessing or decontamination, the first step is to clean. That's why we say cleaning, disinfection, and or sterilization. So the first step to disinfection or sterilization or reprocessing of a medical device is to clean so that we can remove debris and remove organic matter. Next slide. So um, I have 
presented this uh, classification of medical devices so that you can know what level of disinfection or sterilization to use or level of processing for different medical devices. Because sometimes every, uh, healthcare workers will ask, when do I sterilize? When do I disinfect? So this classification helps to determine which, uh, whether to disinfect or to sterilize. Like I mentioned earlier, the first step for any of these two uh, reprocessing is to clean. So Spalding classified medical devices into critical, semi-critical and non-critical medical devices. The critical devices are those that go into the sterile cavity. So for example, during surgery, like surgical instruments, uh, bowel seat for sepsis, so, um, the pleural cavity, the uh, peritoneal cavity, those are sterile cavities. So during surgery, uh, get going to sterile cavities and the minimum to do is sterilization. So for critical devices, so any device that goes into a sterile cavity must be sterilized. So if it's a, re a reusable device, then it must be sterilized. If it is semi-critical, semi-critical devices are those that make contact with mucous membrane. So they do not enter into sterile cavities, but into mucous membrane or non-intact skin. For example, endoscopes, uh, anesthesia equipment, vagina, speculum, all these go into the uh, mucous membranes and they are called semi-critical uh, devices. So for these, a minimum of high level disinfection, sterilization is also okay, but minimum should be high level disinfection. Uh, if possible, then sterilize. Um, then the last one is the non-critical devices. So these are devices that do not, um, that touch only the intact skin. So they do not touch, make contact with the mucous membrane. They do not get into sterile cavities. They only make contact with um, intact skin. So for example, uh, stethoscopes, um, thermometers, pulse oximeter. So all these come in contact with in intact skin. And so you can just use low level disinfection, low level disinfection. Next slide. Then environmental cleaning and um, linear management. So some um, blood and body feeds can be found on surfaces in the hospital or in healthcare settings. So we should do environmental cleaning. So we clean and disinfect surfaces uh, to remove blood and body fluids and debris uh, from the surfaces, especially the eye touch surfaces that are usually, um, that are frequently touched in the healthcare setting. Next slide. Then the other forms of prevention um, in the hospital, because it can, um, viral hepatitis can be transmitted through blood transfusion, uh, screening of blood and blood products before transfusion will be very, very important. Screening for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, syphilis, and some other um, infections to prevent um, transmission in the healthcare setting. Then vaccination for healthcare workers, very, very important. Vaccination. So ideally, it is recommended that all healthcare workers should receive hepatitis B vaccination. Uh, we know that it's not uh, it's not happening everywhere, but it's highly encouraged and highly recommended that all healthcare workers should receive hepatitis B vaccination. And usually they it would be good to screen them first uh, before administering um, hepatitis B vaccines. Then for those who have needle stick injuries or sharps injuries, post-exposure prophylaxis is available. 
uh, for hepatitis B using the um, hepatitis B immune globulin. So that is passive immunization, passive immunization. And that should be given within 48 to 72 hours uh, for it to be effective. And of course, that person should also receive hepatitis B vaccination. So post-exposure prophylaxis for those who have had uh, needle stick injuries, uh, they can receive hepatitis B immune globulin, which is for passive immunization. So screening of blood and blood products, uh, vaccination of healthcare workers, uh, and provision of post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B. And of course, health education like we are doing uh, today. Next slide. So in summary, uh, we've present, I've presented the different uh, IPC practices. That's a standard precaution uh, to prevent hepatitis B uh, transmission in the healthcare setting. And standard precautions are just the minimum standard of infection prevention practices for all patients in all healthcare settings um, by all healthcare workers at all times, assuming and uh, that all blood and body fluid of all patients are potentially infectious. So that once you do that, every patient that comes into the hospital, you protect yourself uh, from blood and body fluids. And we've mentioned the different components of uh, standard precaution, including hand hygiene, use of personal protective equipment, um, sharp disposal, safe injection practices, um, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization of medical equipment. And we also look at other prevention practices uh, like screening of blood for and blood products for blood transfusion, um, immunizing or vaccination, hepatitis B vaccination for all healthcare workers and given post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B for, for healthcare workers who have induced Sharp's injury. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Philip. Thank you for such a wonderful and insightful presentation and also for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Please let's appreciate Dr. Philip with her reactions on the chat box. Please let's appreciate him. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, next, um, we're going to um, welcome um, Dr. Mohamed Bako. He's the senior lecturer, as well as a consultant and a gastroenterologist with our AB Uzaria. Dr. Bako, welcome you to today's presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I will talk on uh, viral uh, uh, hepatitis uh, in the next 20-25 uh, uh, minutes. Can you share my slides? All right. Alina, please project. Thank you. So as a way of uh, introduction, where am I if you see her? Yeah. So as a way of uh, uh, introduction, hepatitis is, a, is an inflammatory condition that affects uh, the liver. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. Yes. So most important of this uh, uh, hepatitis is actually the viral uh, hepatitis or viral hepatitis, uh, which means inflammation of the liver caused by viruses that have uh, affinity for the liver cells. Uh, they are named with alphabets as hepatitis virus A, B, C, uh, D, and E. However, other viruses, such as Epstein-Barr virus, Happy Simplex virus, Yellow Fever virus, Ebola, and even Lassa Fever virus could all resort to hepatitis. And of course, other agents, such as drugs, could also lead to hepatitis, but the most important of them all 
uh, is hepatitis caused by uh, viral uh, hepatitis. Next slide. Uh, viral hepatitis is an infectious condition uh, that has uh, global public, uh, significant uh, global public health importance. Uh, it, can, it can be an acute infection, which means infection that lasts not less, not more than six months, or chronic infection, which means that the virus has persisted for more than uh, more than six months. Virtually all of them cause acute infection, but only B, C, and D cause chronic uh, uh, infection. And from this uh, 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 infection, somebody can develop advanced liver disease, such as liver cirrhosis, uh, hepatoma, that is hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, and liver failure. The most important of these viruses are actually hepatitis B. And C and between the two, I would say that this B is also is the is most uh, important as we will see shortly. Uh, the WHO has estimated that 250 million people, you know, worldwide, are infected with hepatitis B, with 1.2 million infection occurring each year. In 2022, hepatitis B lead to estimated 1 million deaths. And the, the burden of this disease actually in African, uh, South Asia, Southeast, and West, Western Pacific uh, regions of the world. Again, epidemiologically, 91 million Africans live with hepatitis B or C. And in 2019, now around 90,000 new HIV infections were recorded. Why uh, 210,000 new HCV infections were recorded in Africa? 80,000 uh, people you know, died from hepatitis B uh, related uh, uh, diseases, and 45,000 uh, individuals died from HCV related uh, diseases in Africa in 2019. And then the, 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 the pressing thing here is that only few, 2%, 2% of, the, of these people, these figures we are quoting in Africa are actually linked to care. Only 2% of individuals with hepatitis B are linked to care, with only 0.1% being treated. And for hepatitis C, about 5% were diagnosed and nearly 0% are treated. Also, if you look at the coverage for vaccines in Africa, according to the WHO, it's far less than the global uh, coverage. This is very important because the first presenter has alluded to the fact that part of the prevention for hepatitis B is to actually care for people that has hepatitis B and C. It's actually is to actually care for people that has uh, these infections. So we can see that majority of individuals with hepatitis B and hepatitis C infections are not linked to care. Next slide, please. In Nigeria, the Federal Ministry of Health estimated that we have, among adults, we have about 8.4% prevalence for hepatitis B and 1.1% prevalence for hepatitis C. Uh, the WHO, however, in, two, in 2021, estimated that Nigeria has a prevalence of 5.7%. Uh, uh, these are estimates that are based on certain, certain uh, ob observations. Yes, but, the, but, but of course, we, we, we lack data on percentage uh, diagnosed and even percentage uh, uh, linked to care. It will however not be too different from what I've stated uh, earlier for Africa. What are the modes of transmission of these viruses? We have a perinatal transmission generally in sub-Saharan Africa and even Southeast Asia, which include mother to child uh, transmission. 
We also have child to child. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Dr. Manko. Dr. Manko, please, we are still on the slide of yes, epidemiology. Yes. We are still on the slide showing epidemiology. No, next slide, please. We are, I think we've even gone beyond this one. Yes, we have gone beyond this. We are now at mode of transmission. Thank you. Mode of transmission. Sorry, mode of transmission. That's where we are now. So we, we have a, a, a mode of transmission, mother to child, child to child. Uh, th this is this mother to child and child to child is actually the very important route of transmission in, in our setting. And the uh, mother to child could occur, mother to child transmission could occur while the baby is in utero during delivery, which is the most uh, commonly uh, um, uh, time when mother transmits hepatitis B to child. It could also occur even after delivery. Then child to child, particularly uh, when they are playing in pairs, in groups, you know, the, the factors that are responsible for this are not very certain, but people have thought of, okay, sharing of uh, shafts, transmission through body fluid, uh, 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 sharing of shafts, particularly, in localities where they where they practice local circumcision, local uh, scarification marks, where one instrument is used for virtually all the cohort of children at in that uh, mm -hmm. particular community, we also have transmission of infected blood and blood products, multiple sexual partners or risky sexual uh, behaviors, intravenous drug abuse, and then sharing of unsterilized. Uh, uh, shafts. Next slide. We have who are the people at risk? Next slide, please. Who are the people at risk for these infections? We have infants of infected mother as shown above, household members of infected persons, spouses of infected persons, sexually promiscuous individuals, intravenous drug abusers, patients on repeated blood transfusion and, maintain, and, 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 and patients that are maintenance uh, hemodialysis. We also have people that work or that uh, work in certain uh, uh, um, uh, places for such as healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are particularly at risk uh, yeah, in, in individuals, as well as people that work in camps and uh, uh, people that people that work in camps. Next slide, please. What are the signs and symptoms of infection with this viral hepatitis? Initially, in acute hepatitis, patients could have fever, joint pain, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, headache, uh, which are generally called prodromal symptoms. And after these symptoms, then the patient goes into a etheric phase, which, and the symptoms in this phase will include jaundice, right upper abdominal pain or swelling, dark urine, uh, or body itching. In severe cases, somebody could bleed from the nose, from the GI tract, from the urinary system, and patient could have features of uh, encephalopathy, such as loss of uh, consciousness. Uh, some patient may be asymptomatic, even in the acute setting, they may be asymptomatic. Next slide, please. What are the sequelae? What are the sequelae of this infection, particularly this hepatitis B and C? Chronic hepatitis, I've mentioned before that B, C, and D lead to chronic uh, hepatitis. And from chronic hepatitis, patients could develop liver cirrhosis or even liver cancer. And uh, uh, death from hepatitis generally usually result from liver cirrhosis or liver uh, cancer. As you could see, it's a diagram of a normal liver and a cirrhotic uh, liver. This one shows a tumor in the liver on the background of a liver cirrhosis. 
what are the various tests that we can do for patients that has uh, hepatitis? Uh, one, liver function test, which will show abnormal liver enzymes. Alanine amino transferase will be elevated. Please, uh, hold on, Dr. Manko, it's like your slides have not moved yet. Okay. So next slide, please. I've seen to see the pictures. So. Yes. So this picture, this photograph just showed normal liver and a cirrhotic liver. This is a complication of hepatitis B and C. This is a, this shows liver cancer. Next slide. Shows liver cancer, which is also another complication or sequelae of infection with hepatitis B and C. Next slide, please. Um, the various yeah, tests that can be done will include liver function tests, which will show elevated oh, liver oh, 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 uh, such as uh, alanine amino transferase, aspartate amino transferase, and serum, serum bilirubins. In, in liver cirrhosis, the serum proteins will be reduced, the serum protein, the serum albumin will be reduced, and levels of serum globulin will, will go up. Ultrasound scanning of the liver will show changes in the liver as we have depicted above, and can also show features such as ascites, enlarged uh, as spleen in patients that has liver cirrhosis, or, or, or mass in the liver if patient has a patrocellular carcinoma. Then the test for the etiology of this liver disease, which will include H H hepatitis B viral serological markers and uh, hepatitis C uh, viral antibody, as well as hepatitis B DNA or hepatitis C uh, viral, uh, hepatitis C RNA viral load. Uh, to diagnose hepatitis B, we look at the markers on the serological uh, 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 profile. For instance, for acute hepatitis B, the, the surface antigen will be positive. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. We are looking at the, the interpretation of hepatitis B viral serological markers. Uh, which can be used to diagnose hepatitis B viral infection. One can see that hepatitis in, in acute hepatitis B virus, the surface antigen will be positive. The IgM hepatitis B core antibody will also be positive. And the hepatitis B E antigen may be positive. The viral DNA load will be there and the viral enzymes will be elevated. In chronic Hepatitis B, the super antigen will be positive, the core antibody, IgG component of the core antibody will be positive, and the E antigen will either be positive or negative, likewise the E antibody. And depending on if it is an active uh, uh, chronic infection or not, the DNA2 uh, can be elevated. Then the table also showed features of inactive carrier states, patients that are in immune tolerant phase, patients that have been previously vaccin vaccinated, and patients that have had resolved hepatitis B a viral infection. So from these markers, one could say that, one could say what form of hepatitis B infection uh, the patient has. What of diagnosis of HCV infection? Usually there is a screening antibody that is that should be the first to be done which if is positive indicates exposure, whether an ongoing ex, uh, infection or a previous uh, infection. But to confirm the diagnosis, what we need to do HCV RNA assay. This is what will show confirmation of infection. Next slide, please. This is what we, this is what we show Hepatitis confirmation for hepatitis B, hepatitis C viral uh, infection. Uh, when RNA is positive in the patient, uh, uh, in the patient serum, the challenges we have in this uh, environment is the cost implication for doing this test. HCV RNA, HCV general load will require uh, uh, PCR, which are quite expensive and out of reach 
out of reach of most of, of our patients. So as we'll see later, the, uh, uh, the WHO is trying to modify uh, uh, algorithm for management of hepatitis C and hepatitis, hepatitis B viral infection uh, in, in areas where access to these facilities uh, are not there. How do we treat this virus, these viruses? Next slide. Yes, so in treatment of these viruses, because they are viral illnesses, it, they are not as easy to treat. And that is why prevention is actually better than treating them. Uh, the aim is to reduce the viral load, is to bring down the amount of the virus in the individual. And by that, we improve morbidity as well as mortality. Most of the time, hepatitis B virus is not curable. With or without treatment, it's only about 90% or so that we achieve cure, meaning disappearance of the surface uh, antibody. But with the drugs available, it, hepatitis C virus can be cured most of the time. The decision to treat these patients because of this uh, 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 factor that not all of them could be cured is therefore the, based on several uh, factors. Uh, the first line drug we use in treatment of hepatitis B actually tenofovir and then tecava. There are other drugs that can be used in the management, uh, such as adefova, uh, telbivudine, uh, and, and lamivudine. Yeah, even though lamivudine is being downplayed seriously now because of uh, issues of uh, issues of resistance and treatment of hepatitis B. No, back to the next. Back, go back to the previous slide, please. Yes. No, previous slide. Previously again. No, go back to the, the treatment. The treatment. Yes, yes, yes. So, 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 you, you, hepatitis B is usually treated with one drug. Uh, it's readily available in these drugs, tenofovir and Tecava are readily available. Uh, uh, in, in, they are fairly available, but they are also a bit expensive. Then for C, we use a combination of directly acting antivirus. Uh, for instance, sofotuba by platasvar. This combination is actually a pan-genotypic combination that takes care of genotype one to C, to six of uh, hepatitis C uh, virus. The challenge with this drug is actually the cost and the accessibility to most of our patients. I could see earlier that though 5% of the people were diagnosed with hepatitis C, only almost 0% are linked to care. The cost of this drug is actually one of the reasons why patients will not be able to get uh, treated, uh, uh, leading to such the small uh, percentage in terms of care for these patients. Next slide, please. The what, I, what is the recommendation for treatment for hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B? Now, this is by WHO. WHO says all patients with chronic hepatitis B with chronic hepatitis, with one, evidence of significant fibrosis or cirrhosis should be, should be treated for hepatitis B. Uh, this fibrosis, of course, one will expect that it is true liver biopsy that one will be able to determine uh, this level of fibrosis. But WHO have come up with uh, 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 non-invasive methods such as APRI score, elastography to determine significant fibrosis or features of cirrhosis, general features of cirrhosis, as we have seen on the ultrasound above. Or if you are able to do the DNA load, the DNA is more than 2,000 international units per mil, and the ALT is above upper limit of normal. These individuals should be treated. Or there is presence of co-infection with hepatitis C, for instance, hepatitis D, for instance, or, H, or even HIV. The individual should be treated. The individuals with family issue of liver cancer, the individual with established cirrhosis, immune suppression from use of drugs or, 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 or other forms of immune suppression, comorbidity such as diabetes or extra hepatic manifestation, including global nephritis, for instance, because hepatitis B is, is known to cause that. 
regardless of their pre score, the DNA load or ALT levels in the that individual should be on treatment for hepatitis B. Or if the individual cannot afford to do DNA load, persistently abnormal ALT levels, which is defined as ALT level two ALT levels above upper limit of normal at unspecified interval during a six month to twelve month period, uh, patient should be considered treatment. I think this is where we in Africa or people that are in low uh, income countries uh, will, will fall. When most of our patient, when our patient cannot uh, do DNA load, that should not hinder uh, 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 treatment for hepatitis B. Uh, this is the latest WHO uh, guideline. Next, next slide, please. The recommendation for treatment of, for, for treatment of acute hepatitis B. Uh, generally, acute hepatitis B doesn't warrant treatment, except if it is uh, as very severe. When patient has severe or fulminant hepatitis, a uh, patient may benefit from tenofova or entecava, and the duration could, could vary. Really, there's no established uh, uh, period. It could be three months, six months, even 12 months, even beyond, depending on the situation. And the reason for treatment is to prevent uh, uh, a death and even to prevent uh, uh, persistent of the infection, meaning it shouldn't become a chronic uh, infection. For C, the WHO, both the WHO, uh, uh, American Association for Study of Liver Disease and even the Official Disease Society of, um, of um, America uh, agree that all patients with chronic or even acute hepatitis C should be treated with some exceptions. For instance, somebody that has a short lifespan. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. Uh, uh, all patients with acute or chronic HIV infection should be treated with some exception, exceptions. For instance, the WHO says patients that are less than 12 years of age uh, uh, should, should, should can wait until they become uh, 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 12 years. Uh, there's also an exception if the patient last span is, is short. This patient last one is already short, except that can be changed by giving uh, 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 HCV uh, treatment. Generally speaking, all patients with hepatitis C viral infection should be treated except with some exceptions. Prevention, which my uh, colleague has dwelled on extensively, uh, will include advocacy and raising awareness of, of, of viral hepatitis, such as what we are doing now, safe and effective vaccination. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, including hepatitis B. Next slide, next slide, please. Yes, primary prevention, advocacy and raising awareness of viral hepatitis, safe and effective vaccination. Uh, for instance, putting HBV vaccination as part of the national program organization for, for children, safe blood practices, safe sex practices, safe injection practices, as my colleague has already alluded to. Other preventive strategies include early diagnosis, early diagnosis and linkage to care. I think this is where we have a lot of challenge because most, as we saw above, most of the patients are not linked to care. In fact, most of the patients are not even aware that they have, they have uh, hepatitis B viral infection. You could see 2%, only 2% of patients who are diagnosed with hepatitis B. Uh, 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 infection. So the majority of the patients that have hepatitis B infection in this our setting are not even aware that they have hepatitis B. So strategies to encourage early diagnosis is to go a long way in preventing hepatitis B because such individuals that have hepatitis B and are not aware are actually a source of new uh, infection. People that have hepatitis B should be linked to care. That process should be completed. Once diagnosis is made, the individual should be linked to care. You could see the small levels of linkage to care, even when patient is aware that he has this uh, 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 disease. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. Yes. So individual efforts should be made as well as well to link these people to care. Uh, uh, you could see hepatitis, hepatitis C, in fact, uh, almost zero treatment 
for, for reasons such as high cost of, of care. Then proper management, proper management of infected patients because of the body of this uh, uh, virus is, is specialist care for everybody may not be feasible. Therefore, there is need for other health care workers that are not specialists in managing this individual to be involved in managing this individual because of the high body. Perhaps that will reduce the, or in, improve on the people that are linked to care and has gotten proper, uh, 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 proper management. Uh, uh, trainings could be done, organized for low uh, uh, or non-specialist uh, uh, doctors or, or other healthcare workers on identification of this patient and uh, criteria for, for commencing uh, uh, antiviral uh, therapy uh, 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 and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Counseling is also very important. As my colleague has alluded to, uh, vaccinate household members for sexual contact of infected people who don't share or sharp objects with people who cover open wounds and scratches, clean blood spills with household bleach, particularly people that are at home, when if hepatitis B, if hepatitis uh, B individuals spill, spill blood, for instance, uh, household bleach could be used to, to disinfect uh, uh, the, 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 the area to prevent transmission to other uh, people. Then the WHO also has, the WHO suggests strategies to address challenges of viral hepatitis because of its body in the world, such as awareness, partnership, resource mobilization. We saw that the drugs are expensive. The tests, the PCR is also expensive and not available in most uh, centers, even in tertiary centers uh, uh, in, in low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yes. So the WHO strategies to address challenges of viral hepatitis will include awareness, partnership, uh, resources, resource mobilization, correct policies for data collection and, and action uh, therefrom, prevention of transmission, screening, care, and treatment. Uh, but before we go, I will leave us with this question, can viral hepatitis, particular hepatitis B, be regarded as a non, as a uh, neglected tropical disease? Because it, it seems as if hepatitis is not getting attention, like HIV and AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and even some of these viral uh, hemorrhagic uh, fevers. If we're able to answer this question, I think it will go a long way in, 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 in preventing, uh, uh, you know, the scourge of this uh, infection. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marco. We really, really appreciate this present. Very, very timely, just like you said. Uh, hepatitis is a neglected uh, uh, infection in Nigeria. So please, let's share our questions, not just Nigeria, but also globally. So please, let's drop our questions. Um, so before I look at the question, let's also appreciate him for that wonderful presentation. So you can share your reactions on the chat box. Dr. Philip, I want to believe you're still on the call because we have questions for you too. Um, before I read the questions from the chat box, um, the first question goes to Dr. Philip. I have a question. So uh, the question is, uh, as a member of uh, uh, Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee and also the focal person for IPC in LUT, uh, you can agree with me that issue of compliance to protocols is a very, very uh, big issue in our healthcare facilities. So we'd love to ask, how can healthcare facilities ensure compliance? Thank you so much. And okay, sorry. And then before you compliance respond, to, I also compliance have a to what, please? To the protocols, disposal protocols. Okay. Yes. And then, sorry, before you respond, uh, my question for Dr. Marco is: um, We, you are aware, or we are aware that um, viral hepatitis symptoms uh, share similar symptoms with malaria. 
if I could, I remember I have a family member who was um treating malaria so often, mm -hmm. like taking several drugs. She go to the hospital and then she's giving malaria drugs. But because uh the symptoms persisted, we had to you know refer her to another hospital before um it was diagnosed that she had her hepatitis. So very hepatitis and she has similar symptoms with malaria. So the question is how can we improve on early diagnosis? Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Philip, please go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Philip, you can go ahead with your response. The question is how can healthcare facilities ensure compliance with um, disposal, object disposals in our health facility protocols? Thank you. Your mic is muted, Dr. Philip. Sorry, um, the first thing would be to provide the infrastructure. So if you say, for example, people should dispose shops, then you, the shops box should be provided. So you must put the facility, healthcare facility must provide the infrastructure or what the healthcare workers need uh, to be able to do what we have said they should do. So to practice standard precautions, for example, and hygiene and all the things we have listed, we need to make sure that all those things are provided for the healthcare workers. Then we need to educate them. So we need to educate the healthcare workers on the um, pre on the, all these methods of prevention um, in different different ways of educating, including using practical methods to demonstrate uh, what exactly we want them to do. Then thirdly, we need to provide reminders uh, in the workplace as posters uh, in the workplace to remind them of what they need to do. Then we can now start to do audits to see whether um, the healthcare workers are complying with um, the policies. Of course, we would have written all this down as guidelines or policies or SOPs uh, for the healthcare workers to use. And so we create a climate in which um, the healthcare worker is encouraged to uh, practice the standard precaution. Uh, because you don't, you are not going to tell a healthcare worker to uh, practice to use PPE that you have not provided, to wash hands if there is no water and soap. So when doing audits or checking for compliance, the first thing is to ensure that you have provided what they need and you have educated them. And most often, if this is done, they will comply. What you look at the audits and also be able to give them feedback. Once you have done the audit, you need to give them feedback. Look, I will come to your word uh, based on we provided shops, uh, boxes, but only five out of ten uh, points of care as sharp boxes. Why? Then they can be able to tell us and we discuss and provide solutions. And as we repeat that uh, process, then uh, compliance will increase and then. Um, would achieve our aim. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that response. Okay. Um, we have a question here. It says, is there a possibility of transmitting hepatitis through sweat? Dr. Marco, you can go ahead and respond to this, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. So let, let me start. Okay, let me start with this. Yes, hepatitis B virus is present in all body fluid. So the, it can be transmitted through sweat. However, hepatitis B don't penetrate intact skin. It can't penetrate an intact skin. So if you shake somebody that's hepatitis B, for instance, you can't get hepatitis B, except 
you are your your skin is compromised, for instance. Yeah, even kissing don't transmit hepatitis B except one the 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 the, 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 the somebody has a sore in the mouth or something. That is when it can go in. Otherwise, on an intact skin, for instance, it 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 can't uh, it you know it 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 can be transmitted uh, that way. It is, however, present in all body fluid. And the other question you asked initially was, um, how do we get to link all the people that has hepatitis B to care? It actually has to do with a, a massive enlightenment campaign. You could see our our prevalence, for instance, in Nigeria, the prevalence rate when when in an hyper endemic region, according to the Ministry of Health. So therefore, we have prevalence, we have a high prevalence rate. There are many millions of Nigerians are infected with hepatitis B. And the care, to link them to care, it, the body will be too much if you leave them to only the specialists. So therefore, we have to do a massive enlightenment campaign and train even the non-specialists to, to manage these people. Even the non-doctors can be trained to identify these people and refer to the to the doctors, for instance. Uh, one strategy could be every patient that comes to the hospital should be offered screening for hepatitis B and C. Just the way we do blood pressure for, for people that are at risk of blood pressure, for instance, or urinalysis that nurses do for, for virtually all the patients that comes to the hospital. So we could also introduce that kind of strategy. And anybody that is uh, as a, as a hepatitis B could be linked uh, to care. I've also I've seen a number of questions. I don't know if I could talk on some of them. OK, you can go on, on, the, on the chat okay. box. Some, someone okay. asked that, um, someone asked um, that, uh, why is it that uh, hepatitis C is being is treated and then hepatitis B is not is not all patient with hepatitis B that is treated. Hepatitis C, hepatitis C, most patients with hepatitis C, or up to about 85% of hepatitis C infection will progress to chronicity. A significant percentage of them will develop liver cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and, and patient can die from there. Then but 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 and the disease is curable. So so since it's curable, so why can't so the strategy is that offer everybody treatment since it is curable? Whereas hepatitis B is not curable. Most of the time it is not curable. Even with treatment, it's not curable. So therefore, you have to select patients that will benefit from the treatment. And that is why hepatitis, not all patients with hepatitis B have been offered treatment. Because even if you do the surface antigen will not disappear. Then the second aspect is somebody asked, can hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B patients have spontaneous resolution, meaning without treatment? Yes, it's possible. But again, how many percentage will achieve that? How many percentage will achieve? with treatment or without treatment? It's only about 10% that will achieve spontaneous that will achieve. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so there's another question here. Um, how effective is a hepatitis B um, vaccine in Nigeria? How effective is vaccination in Nigeria? And what are effective? Okay, go ahead, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Hello? Okay, hello, sir, are you there? Please go ahead. Okay, uh, looks like it's network, network issue. So maybe uh, Dr. Philippe may have to assist with the question, how effective is vaccination in Nigeria, hepatitis B vaccines in Nigeria? S sorry, I didn't get this, your last question call was coming in. Okay, sir, okay, sir. Good to have you back. So it says, uh, how effective is hepatitis B vaccine in Nigeria? Uh, well, I don't have. Hey, oh, that's the battle they push me. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. 
<laughs> Dr. Marco, are you still there? Okay, so while he rejoins us, I'll read the next question to Dr. Philip.